I mean, that goes back to my question regarding the community health centers, because I know a lot of rural communities love their community health centers, but I'm not sure that anybody on the ground within that health center is thinking about this problem. And, and I'm not sure we've incentivized them to, you know, to, to do that. We have a lot of highly motivated people in public health departments, um, yeah. and, and people forget about them. And yeah. uh, they're really motivated. Uh, they are, they're just do-gooders par excellence. They are. But, but they don't have the knowledge. They, they, somebody at the central level has got to sh- sh- shoot information back to them and say, you, you've got to watch, you've got to isolate, or you've got to move them out. Yeah. They've got to be told, and then somebody better get down there to help them. Uh, because, and we're going to have to force them to have evacuation plans. Yeah. Um, and then back them up. I actually, you know, so we had a suicide cluster in my, in my neighborhood, my local neighborhood. We lost 14 young boys over about 18 months. And uh, it was my local health center. It was the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And then we reached out to CDC in Atlanta. And so it was that whole network, sort of what you're describing, for a different type of problem, but, but it, was, it was very much uh, a scramble until we got the right people in place and, and, uh, and had an opportunity to address it. Um, I, I want to ask each of you, so you each got about a minute and 15 seconds. Uh, what, is it, what else do you think is important for, for the, the ranking member and I to know and members of the committee to know is there what what else do you think is very important for us to understand? I mean, we have your your written statements, so I know you've got your your top five ideas. But what else is out there that you think is lacking that uh, that we might need to address, or something that might not have uh, percolated up in our discussion already today? Uh, Dr. Boucher, thank you very much. Um, I'll comment on a couple of things quickly. Uh, we didn't really hit that much on diagnostics, but um, an area where we really are on the edge, I think, of making some big advances are on diagnostic tests. So that's an ability to know if a patient has a virus or a bacteria causing their infection, or if it's a bacteria, which bacteria. If we knew that, we could impact this problem of resistance, we, we believe, in a really meaningful way. And so um, there are efforts going on in that public-private partnership I mentioned is funding some diagnostic companies, but there's still work to do on the path to approval and marketing and using them in our hospitals. Um, another area that I don't think we probably highlighted enough was the, the One Health approach. So we understand that the problem of antibiotic resistance really flows between humans, animals, and the environment. And we in the United States have made some good progress with our food animals, with the veterinary feed directive that was passed um, sort of banning the use of antibiotics as growth promoters in, in food animals. But this problem on a global scale is huge. The amount of um, people in the world who are going to be eating meat is going up and up and up. And we know that a lot of resistance comes from the developing world to us. So this interrelationship is very important in the way we address this problem. And this is something that we're focused on in our center in terms of research. We're studying things like passing of resistance from your pet dog or cat to the family and back and forth. And there are a number of issues here. Uh, as well as in the environment. So I think we want to we want to highlight that. And then the last thing I'll mention is the workforce. We need a robust workforce to to solve this problem. We need doctors, of course, which I'm my bias, but also we need nurses and pharmacists and others. Um, so we at IDSA and, and others are highly engaged in things that will help us recruit and retain the best and the brightest in this field and ensure that they're remunerated uh, adequately to stay in the field. So thank you. Excellent. Dr. George. Uh, Sir, I would just mention two things in particular. Uh, We talked about information flow earlier. I think it's important for you to realize that there's an intelligence issue here as well. The intelligence community has not dedicated a whole lot of resources to this particular threat um, since we shut down our own offensive biological weapons uh, program back in the 70s. Um, They have to step up, but... We're talking about uh, 
diseases and activities that are occurring on the non-classified side as well. So that information, intelligence fusion has to happen, and that information has to go up and down so that it's usable by state and local folks. Um, I would also mention, too, that it's important for you to know, if you didn't already, that the public is actually very concerned about the biological threat. Uh, one of the reasons is almost everybody's had some issue with antimicrobial resistance, of course. Uh, but many know people who have received white powder uh, letters and packages. Um, and also, I think it's important to understand that Hollywood has picked up on this, and they keep churning out these movies that put the biological threat front and center to the public yeah. and keeps it on their minds. Um, so we owe it to the constituents to actually do something about this and move move the uh, you know the the stick forward um, so that they feel better protected. Very good, uh, Mr. Curry. Yes, sir. I know we're running out of time, so I'll just no, limit no, it to no, one. no. You got time? Okay, I'll, I'll I have two things. So the. The first thing I'll say just for you as the chairman and the ranking member, you mentioned congressional oversight. I think Dr. George mentioned congressional oversight. Um, we think the strategy, we're looking at it right now. We're going to report on it later this year. I think it is one of the most, uh, one of the best efforts we've seen so far, and we've been looking at this for a long time to uh, better coordinate biodefense. Um, but Consistent oversight is going to be critical to keep this moving forward. Um, we see across government, we look at everything, everything there is in government, at GAO, and where there is heavy oversight and heavy emphasis, progress gets made. And I think the execution of the strategy is going to be critical. And, and there's going to be some really difficult things in that execution. I mentioned the, the prioritization of resources and budgets across so many departments. It's going to be a huge challenge to be able to look at that holistically. Mr. Curry, you're, you're actually, isn't the GAO currently reviewing the report that Dr. George refer, referred to earlier? Yes, sir. We're reviewing the, we're currently reviewing the National Biodefense Strategy to both ensure that it met the legislative requirements and also to see uh, if it's going to be successful when it's implemented. Okay. And so that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about is that, we, you know, it, it's got to be successful in the execution, but it's going to be a major challenge and it's, it's not going to get implemented minutes successively just by the departments without consistent congressional oversight. Excellent. All right. Is that all you got? Yes, sir. Okay. Dr. Dallas. Yeah, I want to jump right on that along with Mr. Curry. Uh, he mentioned about congressional oversight. I'll give you a perfect example. And the progress that we made in Georgia, you know, we had this influx of uh, Ebola patients coming in. The, re the way we were able to make progress was because there was congressional oversight language that we could get back to where that controlled how the Ebola funding was done. Now, we, as we all know in here, you know, when there's government appropriations, people want to send it off in all sorts of directions. But since there was very firm congressional oversight language, it really made a path for us. And that is probably more than any other single factor other than our enthusiasm and running around in back of ambulances was the fact that there was congressional... And every time we got... Back, we got lip service. No, the congressional language says this. And the, it, then that, that made us, and I, that's what I saw in person. That's how we made uh, the progress we did. I do know that uh, on the Ebola issue that we had asked a certain number of institutions to raise their hand and say, if we're in this situation, we're, we're in. Yeah. And so... You know, to those courageous uh, institutions that that volunteered their services and said, you know, we want to be part of this and we want to we want to step up. The only problem was when it did happen, many were unprepared. They were very willing, yep. but but they were woefully unprepared. And so that's that's sort of the gap between uh, where we want to be and where we actually are. 